Right, well, good morning to those of you here and those who join us across the globe on our podcast and various other mediums. I just want to send love and prayers to those who've been stricken down by the bug this week, of whom Danny is one, so thanks to Connor for uh, moving across the stage to the other side to, to help us out. We pray health and strength to all of you who are uh, sick with the COVID and different bugs this week. I also love to, uh, to Jenny Flint. She had her first uh, round of chemo uh, this week. So we send love and, and prayers to Jenny. We're in touch with her and uh, she's in good spirits and we'll, we'll keep uh, in touch with that and bless them. also wanted to say thank you this morning because, um, you know, we have journeyed a long way from home, if you get what I mean in this church and in our thinking and talking with, you know, some people. I had a chat with Liz the other day, we were talking. And I realized we have journeyed a long way from home, from what was home to some of us in terms of where we were. So I just wanted to say a thank you for being with us and staying with us and journeying. Uh, Because as Scott Peck put it, we have chosen the road less traveled. And we make the road by walking, and that's what we're doing. And uh, a lot of this is not is not just about us, it's about what we are trying to put in place for others to follow. And like I said, across the world, if we could gather all the people from across the world who are part of this journey, we'd be pretty full this morning. Um, But we don't have that privilege here, uh, but we do have that privilege by media. Um, But yeah, maybe one time we here will be able to reach that point where we'll be able to gather more people who are on this journey. So we, we've just, I've just flipped the front end around this week, so I'm uh, going to play the first video after I talk to you, uh, because I made a statement last week, and I want to pick up on that statement, because I think it's important. I hope you can follow with me and track this, because I, I think it's a critical understanding for all of us, because I want to talk about what's the matter with matter. You know, the truth is, in almost all circumstances... The quest for certainty overshadows the quest for truth. Now, I want you to let that sink in because wherever you go, in what culture, in what country, in what nation, whatever whatever we face in challenges, whether it's it's religious challenges, whether it's COVID across the world, whether it's global warming, whether it's racial issues, the truth is, in almost all circumstances, the quest for certainty overshadows overshadows the quest for truth. And that's because we prefer security over honesty. We would much rather feel secure, which sometimes means we can't address or accept what is the full truth and honesty, because it would upset our security. And this human being, this is not critical, it's just, it's just an observational fact that we prefer security over honesty. And we love matter rather than spirit, because we're uncomfortable, really. And I know I grew up in a Pentecostal environment where we talked about the Holy Spirit, but in reality, we made matter of what was spirit, and then we believed in the material thing that we were doing that was the expression of it, but spirit actually scares us because of how you can't control it. So we love matter in structure more than spirit. And the truth is, because of that, we would rather have belief than faith. Faith is a messy thing. And when we talk about the Christian faith, the majority of Christians who have the Christian faith don't have the Christian faith. They have the Christian belief. And even then, I could argue it's not the Christian belief. It's the Jesus belief that was constructed as a religion out of the life of Jesus that made us miss what Christian faith is actually all about. And one of our great problems then is how much we have materialized spirit and spiritualized matter. Now let me explain that a little bit. What it means is that we want our spirituality to be a solid entity. We want it to be something that we have, that we do, that we can feel, that we see. And so we've immediately reduced it from spirit to material. Do you understand what I'm saying? So now we're approaching it from a whole different perspective. And then to make that solid entity, we make the solid entity the thing on which we base our whole spirituality. Which becomes religious materialism. 
So the truth is in most Christian environments, particularly evangelical, charismatic ones, there is a Christian materialism. Everything is measured. Was it a good meeting? Well, how do you know it was a good meeting? Or we felt, we did, we sang, we experienced, we heard, and it's all down to matter, right? Got nothing to do with the essence of, it's measured by material Things Just like in life, we tend to measure our validity and value by the material things we possess, the stuff. And the truth is, Christianity has become full of stuff, just like Judaism was full of stuff, and just like every religion is full of stuff. And we get caught up with the stuff, and we think if we have the stuff, we've got the thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, the truth is, we operate... And remember, more in pictures than we do in sound. That's a, that's a reality of the human psyche. And the brain, the brain images or imagines that which translates the words we hear or read. So you may not realize it, but we begin to create pictures and scenarios and images we imagine from the words that we hear. That's where imagination can affect interpretation. Because once we're influenced by an image within the words, we have imaginations. And the truth is, I have to say, my personal view is that there are great elements of Christian doctrine that are more to do with imagination than they are to do with revelation. Because we create an image around the words to make the words into matter. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, We do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen... For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So let me ask you a question. So Jesus in the flesh, we have the story of the crucifixion, we have the story of the resurrection, we have the story of him appearing for 40 days, and then we have the story of his ascension into heaven. Now, assuming we accept that those are reality and he ascended into heaven, is Jesus here in the flesh now? Do we see Jesus in the flesh? The answer is no. But now let me read you Paul's words again. For that which, for the things which are seen are temporary. Therefore, the very manifestation of Jesus as Jesus, doing what he did being who he was, was temporary. But we made it permanent. It was temporary because it's not seen. It, it was seen but, now, but the things which are not seen are eternal, so there's something beyond getting stuck in that which can be seen, which is matter and material. Now, I know this might sound quite complicated to some of you, but hang with me, we've got a whole morning. So you might say, why is this even important? Well, here, let me give you a phrase, because once you define, you confine. Once you define... You confine, once you define Jesus in a certain way, you confine yourself to any further revelation of the fullness of God. You confine yourself not to be able to walk and work and go with spirit because now you have defined, and once you define, that's matter, that's material. And the Christ revelation is bigger, it's more, it's beyond, it's all It's spirit, and that's the good news of breaking you free into this. So just a few more things. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul wrote this. He is the image of the invisible God. Now I want you to understand what he's saying. Image is the same word we have for imagine. He is the imagination of... Of the invisible God, the image, the firstborn over all creation, but that means that He is an image, not fully the thing. Now, this is not an anti Jesus message, this is a perspective message. And then in John 14, verse 9, this is what John wrote Jesus answered, Anyone who has seen me has seen. The Father. So did he mean that the Father in heaven looks exactly like the Jewish Jesus 
on earth. Of course he didn't. When you stop to think about it, it didn't mean the Father looks exactly like me because he wasn't talking about matter, he was talking about spirit. The spirit in the Father looks exactly the same as the spirit in me, but it's the unseen thing and if you restrict it or define it to just this, you will confine it to become religion. So when the focus moves from the invisible to the image, the image can quickly become an idol, and the idol becomes the center of a religion. Because image means likeness of, invisible means that which cannot be seen, and now the danger is that, get this, Jesus can become an idol because we've allowed him to be an image and yet we are told from Old Testament writings, you shall create no image. So we have an issue we have to wrestle with. So while ever we allow spirit to remain spirit, remember what we talked about last week from John chapter 3, the wind blows where it wants. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. While ever we allow spirit to remain spirit, we cannot control it. And so we define it into quantifiable measures and we turn spirit into flesh and matter that we can control so that we can control the narrative and the construct and that's what we are looking for because we prefer security over honesty. So let me finish this first section here. We use words to describe image, we use, sorry, we use words to describe, to image, to imagine, to materialize things. But then the thing becomes modeled by the words. Then the words become the thing. And we finish up with the words higher than and controlling of the thing of which the words were about. That's what happened with the Bible. Have a think about that. The words were used to describe image, materialize things. The thing became modeled by the words. So what models what we know? We model it through the words. And then the words become the thing. So we have the Holy Bible. We finish up with the words higher than and controlling of the thing which the words were about. And so we have to go to inerrancy and infallibility because now the words are the all-encompassing defining factor. Now, I've said this many times. If you can contain the fullness of who the divine being of God is within the constraints of a book this thick, then he ain't that much of a God. And so, I want to introduce you to the video. I know we've had quite a long first section. The movie Calendar Girls is a great movie, partly because it's about Yorkshire lasses. And we like Yorkshire lasses. But the film Calendar Girls, it's about a group of Yorkshire lasses who were part of the Women's Institute. And uh, one of the ladies' husbands uh, has cancer and he's dying and they're trying to raise money and they're finding all kinds of difficulties to do and express what they need to do and express within the confines of the organisation that they are in. And so they decided to do a calendar, but not just any calendar, they decided to do a nude calendar. They were all women of a certain age, but they decided this is what they were going to do. It broke the mold. And so, it, any of you that have seen the film and any of you know the story, I mean, it just sold out all across the world. I mean, it was just a major, amazing thing. But the reason I want to show the clip from the film is that, 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 that it was not a film about the pointlessness of the Women's Institute, the organisation. But it was about how the spirit of the organisation had been distilled into one of plum jam and sponge cake making and singing Jerusalem to the exclusion of things which were more true to its reason for being. And so they did the nude calendar, tastefully done, looking to restore something lost. And so you'll see at the first part of it where um, Chrissy used the major character who's the friend of the woman who lost her husband starts the video by saying listen I'm about to commit heresy you know I feel sometimes I should get up every week and start with the phrase listen I'm about to commit heresy 
And why? Because she's about to challenge the materialized perception of the true spirit of the organization. And that's my principle. So Chris says, there are some things more important than council approval. And you want to wonder why we struggle through what we're struggling and why I face it every week and wrestle with it. Because there's some things more important than other churches' approval or other ministers' approval or organizations' approval. And so we'll let you watch the video, uh, but what I do need you to know is that I will be looking for volunteers for the Q Church Naked Calendar. So if you fancy yourself as a March or a February or whatever for 2022, I think that would probably be a good advert for the church. It might fill us up rather quickly if we... uh... Well, maybe we're not quite there (laughs) yet. But watch the video and then we'll pick it up later on. (laughs) Now I am aware that what I bring to you every week and what others bring when we we share this stage uh, can be pretty challenging to things that we have thought and the statements can be like getting punched in the face at where you are in your journey and in your belief. Um, The issue is, in the 30 minutes that we basically have to speak on a Sunday morning, I cannot explain all the things that we talk about, but we're always available for questions and conversation. But what I'm here to do, and I make no apologies for it, is to shake the tree. We're trying to shake the tree so that all the dead stuff and the dead fruit falls out the tree to leave what remains. So I make no apologies for shaking the tree, and I make no apologies for shaking your tree by the things I say, because if you are firm in your faith of the gospel, not just faith in the gospel, then you will find that it brings you to a place of great strength. This is not Antichrist, this is the Christ. And so in that video, um, there are statements that come up on screen as Peter Enns is talking in the one about his book of the sin of certainty. And I just want to hit those first before I move on to the next little bit. And these are the statements, the problem is trusting our beliefs rather than trusting God. And that's the point I'm trying to make, how we have materialized spirituality, spiritualized materialism, because we have a problem, and it's that we want to trust our beliefs. We don't actually want to trust God, because God's dangerous, our beliefs are not. Our beliefs we can define, God we can't. And so we keep the Creator captive to what we are able to comprehend. That's the sin of certainty. That's the thing that um, Bishop Spong says about, about the evangelical church, that we have got stuck in literalism because we keep the Creator captive in what we are able to comprehend. That's what we're trying to change. Pete says the Bible is less, than, less an instructional manual, which is a catalyst or a trigger, and more an internal dialogue. And the more you move to that, the more you will get what the Bible is actually trying to bring you to, which is not belief in it, its relationship with the one who is in it. Next thing he said is, church is often the most risky place to be spiritually honest. I I read a, 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 um, a Facebook message this morning from a dear friend of mine, who's been through some similar experiences to me, and what comes out of his heart and what I hear him say makes it very clear that the church is the most risky place to be spiritually honest. You will get crucified for it, just like Jesus did, being spiritually honest in the religious community of, of, of Judea at the time when he was alive. And then he goes on to say, watching certain... Watching certainty slide into uncertainty is frightening, isn't it, Jen? Watching certainty, watching, watching certainty slide into uncertainty is frightening. But what he does say at the end is, I've come to see this process as sacred and ongoing. This is a sacred process sliding from certainty to uncertainty. And although it's frightening, it is ongoing and it will bring you to the place of Life. Now, some of the terminologies and concepts used in biblical texts to convey a principle are totally lost on us without explanation. And uh, that's why this whole business of if you read the Bible literally rather than literally, a lot of people are going to come to the wrong conclusions about a lot of things. And, and, and one of those things I want to talk to in the context of our talk this morning. See, really, 
if, if you were going to be right, the New Testament should start with John, not Matthew. Because the first book of the Old Testament starts with in the beginning, and John starts his gospel with in the beginning. John is giving us, is giving us the latest update after several thousand years of journey to try and help us to understand what we should have understood right at the beginning, but now we've taken 4,000 years to screw up. And John's saying, okay, let's, let's have a reboot here. Okay, and let me put it in some different words. And so he begins his gospel, within the beginning was the word. Now again, that's lost on us because, as I said to you last week, the English language is not as, it's not as deep and as complex as languages like Greek. So we read word, but there are words for word in other languages. And this word is logos. It means the all-encompassing word, the beginning word, the spoken thing that makes everything happen. And he says this thing, this, somehow this word, this beginning, this, 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 this foundation, this starting point, this originator was in the beginning. Now the lovely thing is, if you understand that, you can be at peace with a lot of things that you'll read about other views and versions on how creation came about, because this is the key. In the beginning, the originator was in the beginning, he calls it the Word, and he said the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, without him nothing was made that has been made, and then he goes on to say in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here's where we lose the context. The literal translation of the word that is dwelt is the word tabernacled. So if you're going to read this correctly, you would have to read, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Now you think, what the heck does that mean, and why is it important? It's more important than the idea, or that Jesus became flesh and lived in the neighborhood, which is the way the message put it, which is lovely, but it doesn't quite catch the point. He tabernacled with us. So, a little bit of Bible understanding here. That word tabernacled tells us a story. And it's to do with the ancient story of the children of Israel being delivered from slavery in Egypt and journeying to a land of promise that they were supposed to take possession of. That's the context. And it's one of the trials of transitions, because there are trials in transition. So tabernacling was part of the trials of transitions. So we've got a group of people leaving where they should have left on a journey to somewhere else, as we've said, journeying to a land of promise that they were supposed to take possession of. That's yours and my journey, journeying to a land of promise that we're supposed to take possession of that's not heaven, Right? any more than it was heaven for these people. But it's there, and it's ready for you, but there's the trials of transitions. And then the problem is that in that journey, these people, God found, were needing material stuff because they couldn't just accept the spirit of the thing. And so the whole story starts working and showing us that illustration. The challenge of moving from and to with the help of a never-absent accompanying presence, because the presence never left them, and, and, um, and that from to, from to, is more about the heart and mind than it is about physical location. And the people who were on that journey first to, well, they weren't the first people, the people we're reading about here, didn't catch that, that it was more about the heart and mind than a physical location. So just like the church, we said it's not about the heart and the mind, it's about a physical location called heaven. It's about another physical location called hell. And we say this because we're very good at missing the point and not understanding the value of life itself. And the other message embedded within is that being in one place for too long creates its own kind of slavery. See, unless you understand the context of tabernacling, if you stay in the same place for too long, it has its own kind of slavery, including staying where we are in our Christian religious spiritual, quote, journey. So the initial visuals given in a tabernacle 
were, were an appeasing attempt to satisfy the desperate desire for a seen thing while attempting to keep it symbolically non-rigid, fluid and temporary. So they're like, we need to see some, we can't just be doing with this, God is with us and let's just go. We need some stuff. We need some things. We need some do. Because we can't handle the fact that we just are and we're moving and we're living so, so you get this thing of the creation of this idea of, of, of tabernacle. He tabernacled among them. So, 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 so it's, it's, it's trying to do it in a non-rigid, fluid, temporary way. So I wrote this, if I were God, and gods have problems, would I perceive my problem to be that much to my frustration, if gods have frustrations, humanity wants to turn everything into a religion? Now you say, well, is that true? I'll mention three words for which I can get in great trouble, but they're very topical. COVID. Climate change. Brexit. I'll throw another one in at risk of my own life. NHS. Now all of those have context and all of those have a right to be considered and a right to be loved, but can you not see that we have turned them all into religion because now there's the ins and the outs, there's the do's and the don'ts, and now you've got the whole thing that we've always had with religions, we now get division and we get unbelievers and we get persecution. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's not the thing itself that's the problem. It's our inerrant need to make a religion of everything. And if you understand God's dealings with humanity, he was fighting against that all the time and still is. You know, something happens and we experience God in a fresh way. What do we have? We make a down religion out of it. We, we make a stupid denomination out of it. We have a, a specific way of doing it then. And if you're not in, you're not. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this was God's problem, if God has problems. And so he's trying to create a way to get through to them without it being rigid and, and keeping it fluid and temporary. And so he, the tabernacle simply means, tabernacle means tent. So he said, let's just use a tent for the illustration and I'll let you do some stuff. I don't personally need it. Because through the prophet Isaiah, he said, listen, I don't care how many bulls and goats and sheep you've sacrificed, you know, it doesn't really mean anything to me. I did that for you to feel okay about you because I feel okay about me and I feel okay about you, but you don't feel okay about you and you don't feel okay about me. The problem's not with God. And so he said, so we'll do this tabernacle thing. Well, I'll, I know I have to do it, but we'll make it a tent so that it's, it's movable. And we've, we've done that with everything. I, mean, I could give you other illustrations from, from that journey and the story, but I won't. And then what we do, we, we have that, but then what we do is we turn tabernacles into temples. Now, if you understand temples are rigid structures with determined practices that cannot be changed that have boundaries of who's in and who's out, and then they have a, a specific kind of clergy who's very much holier than thou, and we limit the access to God, not give access to God, we limit the access to God by the structures that we create, and we have done that by our whole interpretation even of the gospel. We limit access to God, we don't create access to God. And so the tabernacle, that tent that the Israelites had, became the temple, and basically it was all downhill from there. Now what's interesting is if you know anything about the story of Jesus, he came to destroy what? He came to destroy the temple system. He came to destroy that temple system. And, you know, I could give you all the detail of that, but like I said, we don't have time. So what John's trying to convey when he writes in John chapter 1, you know, that that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He's trying to convey that we should see Jesus as another tabernacle manifestation, leading us to a life of revelation and migration, not a static structural system, but we turned him into a temple. A manifestation that creates a problem, a temple manifestation, and that creates a problem. It materializes spirit... <laughs> And spiritualizes matter. 
So what do people call this? Oh, the house of God. No, it's not. It's a plumbing building. Not the house of God. And Jesus came to break that spirit within us, but we still have that mindset, that mentality, because we're stuck in materializing spirit and spiritualizing matter. The temple was a prime example of define, design, confine. And that's been the model of so much. So it's interesting, the temple, and I'll finish this section with this, the temple had a curtain separating you from the holy place where God dwelled, right? What's a curtain made of? Material. Material. What is material the substance of? Matter. So what separated us from the holy place where God dwells? Matter, stuff, practice, ceremony, words. See, the truth is matter will get between you and a full revelation of God. And so the last thing I would say in this section, isn't it therefore fascinating that the Gospels record that the moment that Jesus died on the cross, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Why? He's saying, get the matter out of the way and get back to spirit. I got a whole other section that uh, we'll save for another time because we've, uh, we've used our time up. But what I want to draw your attention to from that last little clip of Calendar Girls is that it illustrates how we can get, even with the best of intentions and with the brilliant start caught up in the spirit, we can get caught up in the material of experience that that story creates that we, and then we begin to miss the point of why we set out on this journey in the first place. And I could say so much about that principle of, we used to call it the cart before the horse. You know, the, the institution takes over from the vision. And that's what is happening here. And that's what I warn you against, why we talked about materializing spirit and spiritualizing material. We can get caught up then in the material experience that our story creates and begin to miss the point of why we set out on this journey in the first place. I wanted to talk to you about something from Luke chapter 24, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it for another time. But the essence of it is two guys are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You can read the story in Luke 24, and they don't recognize the Jesus who is with them, who's the one they were in Jerusalem watching stuff happen to, but now they've lost all sense of who he really is, and then the truth is, there comes a point where he is revealed to them, but the moment they recognize who he is, he disappears. Now, to me, that's been like a stick of dynamite in my experience for the last five years, because what it says to me is, the moment you see Jesus in a particular form, then he disappears from sight, because he doesn't want you to make him be in that form forevermore in a day. It's the equivalent today of me disappearing before you can get your phone out and take a take a picture of me on your phone because if you take that picture that'll become the icon that'll become the model that'll become what you adhere to and we have done that with the Bible we've done that with Jesus we've done that with the journeying of the people of God and we shouldn't do it it's supposed to disappear when it's happened why because that keeps us in spirit and away from matter and so I said I wasn't going to go on and so I won't but uh, I'm not a big fan of Hillsong, I have to say, uh, music. You know, it, it often is not saying what we're saying, and I think they would find us heretical and wouldn't know where to start writing a song sometimes about what we write. That's part of our problem for the music team. But there's one or two good ones, and this just came to mind this morning. So let me finish with two things for you. The first thing being that I said last week, the heartfelt prayer of the 13th century theologian, Master e e Eckhart, might seem to some like, what the heck is he talking about? But his prayer was, God, rid me of God. It doesn't mean he stopped believing in God. It doesn't mean he was no longer on the journey of faith. But it meant the way this has become rigid and stuck and established and material and matter so that we think we've got it down. I need to be rid of that so that I can be aware of and open to what it really is. And so this, this was the words from the song I just wanted to read to close. As a responsive prayer, you call me out upon the waters. 
the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery. In oceans deep my faith will stand. My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. That's all you need to know. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. You can't live in a temple. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me, for I am yours and you are mine. And I absolutely believe this is the one spirit, one Lord, one baptism that sits at the core of the true good news that's found in the Christ. So I ask you to come back from the matter and into the spirit. <laughs> <laughs>